します。from Miami Beach. This is Dr. Home of Neurosurgical TV. This is Dr. John Bennett. Uh, we're, we're having another daily dose. This is number 58 during the COVID times. And I'd like to introduce Mustafa Baskaya. He's going to take it from here. Welcome, Mustafa. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ipe. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, so it's good to be back here. Again, I thank uh, John, Ipe, and the Hira uh, for helping me and the other organizers. So I'll go share my screen. You know how to use this tech. <laughs> Very good. I'm learning. <laughs> per it's, per it's perfect. perfect. <laughs> so as I said before in the previous uh, lectures, my, my uh, clinical practice is one-third skull waves, one-third vascular, and one-third uh, gliomas, uh, difficult region gliomas. So I don't have a huge numbers, but uh, microsurgery is my daily practice. So I think I can talk about microsurgery of arteriovenous malformation and some technical nuances. So I'll, again, I'll start with the uh, 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 this is where I am uh, currently, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, it's a beautiful town uh, located between two, actually, isthmus of three lakes. Uh, and we have a very large medical campus. Uh, so I have no disclosures. Uh, in general, uh, uh, these numbers are, are, I mean, you guys are familiar with uh, these numbers. They're all known numbers. Uh, uh, most of the AVMs are supratentorial. Annual hemorrhage rate varies between two and four percent per year, and most of the patients present with intracranial hemorrhage. And the next uh, symptom is the presentation is the epileptic seizures. Uh, what influences the risk of hemorrhage? This this has been a long uh, years of debate. Uh, you know. Recent hemorrhage increases the risk for sure. If you have a venous outlet stenosis or obstruction, this will definitely increase the risk of hemorrhage. Associated aneurysm, feeding pedicle aneurysm, yes. Intranidal aneurysms, I think to me is all the AVM arteries, varices. It looks like intranidal. I, I'm not sure about that increases anything. Small size, this is again questionable. Deep location, posterior fossa, intra or periventricular location. Again, this, we, we, we are gaining more and more data on this and it probably increases the risk of hemorrhage. Uh, how we make decision and how, we, how to treat AVMs. H is of course very important. Uh, that is closely related to the uh, natural history. Patient's general health, patient's neurological condition, history of recent or past hemorrhages, that especially recent hemorrhage will influence the uh, uh, timing of the treatment, symptoms from the AVM, and that patient's occupation and the hobbies, and also psychological makeup. These are, to me, I think this last two is the most important factors uh, in when you decide how to treat the AVMs, or should you or shouldn't you treat the AVMs. What do we have? Uh, observation, microsurgical resection with preoperative embolization or without embolization, radio surgery, ra radio surgery followed by embolization. Embolization as a, alone uh, with the goal of cure and microsurgical resection after, after radio surgery or sometimes all combination of these, we call it multimodality treatment in some very complex cases that we really, really need to treat. And AVM specific factors, location of the AVM, size, configuration, location of the and the pattern of arterial supply, deep perforators, venous drainage, outflow obstruction, aneurysms, and goes on like this. Uh, so, and, Surgeon-related factors. Does the surgeon have a 
experience? Do we have availability of embolization and radio surgery in that institution we are treating the patient? And familiarity with the results and morbidity of each treatment modality, you have to be, your knowledge should be up to date when you are treating the AVMs. And do you have a supporting facilities such as neuro ICU, neuroanesthesia? Do you have intraoperative angiography? Do you have hybrid OR? And in addition to experienced surgeon, you should have an experienced assistant. This is Yashargi classification. You can, you can find this and I find it very, uh, uh, very helpful. For some reason, most of my patients are either singular, colossal or, or uh, medial basal temporal region uh, uh, AVMs. And basic principle, this is the subject of the today's uh, uh, webinar. Fundamental principles, three things, find, coagulate and divide, disconnect the arterial feeders. Dissect it to nidus circumferentially. And at last, divide the main drainage vein or veins. So you have to maintain these this three goals uh, throughout the surgery you are performing. And it's very important to preserve the main venous drainage until last second to, to reduce to prevent the uh, uh, swelling of the AVM and, and, and causing the spontaneous hemorrhage from the AVM. And main goal, we're gonna remove the AVM completely with minimally interfering with the normal parenchyma surrounding the AVM and normal vascular supply to the surrounding region. What about the general technique? Large craniotomy. Don't be minimalist. Don't try to be minimalist when you are dealing with the AVMs. Oh, I'm gonna do very small exposure. I'm gonna remove this grade three AVM. That's not possible. You have to inspect the entire cortical vascular anatomy, inspect the gyral and sulcal anatomy, and to compare the location of feeding arteries and draining veins with the angiogram. You have to have your angiograms, your imaging studies available and constantly comparing them by visual inspection of the AVM and going back checking, yes, is this the AV feeder? Is this feeder coming from the bottom? Is this coming from the right, left, or whatever? And craniotomy should compass the at least at least few centimeters around the AVM. When you are performing the craniotomy, especially for the giant AVMs or very large AVMs, sometimes they can recruit the transosseous feeders. So you should be aware of these feeders. So you don't wanna lose tons of blood while you are opening the head. And draw opening just enough to again go encompassing the all AVM area. And when you are reflecting the dura, you have to be aware where the draining veins, arteries, are there any dural feeders? If there are dural, dural feeders, you have to coagulate and divide them. And when you are reflecting dura, exercise, exercise precautions to avoid tearing the, tearing the veins that will cause the problem at the very uh, beginning of the, your dissection. And once you inspect, start dissecting, identify as many as feeders on the, on the surface. Uh, don't, just don't jump and start resecting. First inspect, identify the feeders, and identify the uh, draining veins, anything on, on the surface, and be, start dissecting by opening the arachnoid adjacent to arteries and the veins. Skeletonize all these completely. And open the sulci to find feeders and opening the south side will also relax the brain. Follow feeders to the AVM nidus through that sulcus you open and, and never take until they reach to the AVM nidus. Don't assume this is a feeder. You can have a transit vessels on Passan arteries and just giving the side feeders to the AVM. And if you take it early, you are taking to the blood supply to the normal brain. And try to differentiate 
feeding arteries from the draining veins. Uh, this comes with the experience, but usually veins are larger and, and, and uh, more delicate, and they think a little more tortures. Uh, and once you complete this initial dissection and then start opening the airy sulcus around the AVM, find the secondary tertiary feeders, smaller feeders will tra traverse within the sulcus and then reach the AVM and making sure these are really, really real feeders and not the normal arteries. And as Yashargil described, sprawling circumferential dissection. Start from the top, go like a cone to the bottom of it and continuous dissection and try trying to avoid problems, especially too much coagulation of the AVM veins or the, or the AVM nidus that will change the hemo, hemodynamics. If you do it early, it will cause problems. It will engorge the AVM and you'll, you won't have enough, enough space to dissect. When you coagulate any vessel, arteries or the veins, don't coagulate at one point and don't be persistent. Just coagulate in few millimeter and gradually shrink, just not one time, okay? And irrigating bipolars, or if you don't have an irrigating bipolar, while you are coagulating, irrigation by your assistant is, is crucial. And if you encounter a bleeding from the AVM nidus while you are dissecting, don't try to coagulate and stop the bleed. Just, just put a little tamponade, little, little packing uh, 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 gel form surge cells or cotton and then and then compress gently and the weight okay never never tamponate the brain side okay that will that will cause the bleeding you won't be able to see and it may cause intraparenchymal or interventricular hemorrhages so if you want to need to pack when you encounter the bleeding pack the nidal side and make sure you are not losing and the feeders and they are they are they are withdrawing from the uh, dissection plane so to show you the uh, uh, basic principle this is not a very complex avm but it's on the surface and incidentally found uh, to show the anatomy and the, my philosophy on dissecting i'll start with this this is a 54 year old man uh, with incidentally found avm as it's in the in the right non-dominant temporal lobe and how are we gonna do it? This is how we're gonna do it. Okay, normal tension and the and the most relaxed position for the patient and the surgeon, and initially carefully inspect. See there, if you, if I'm pulling this, reflecting the dura suddenly, I can I can rip these draining veins. So there there most of the time this in superficial AVM, these vessels will be stuck to the dura. So be careful, dissect them, and then gradually reflect them. Then once you, you are done with the dural opening, inspect. Uh, inspect by dissecting the arachnoid around these arteries. Are these veins? Are these feeding arteries? And define the anatomy of that particular AVM. And be, don't take anything right away. Don't go dive into the AVM or near by the AVM. And all dissection techniques, including the spreading, sharp, or peeling techniques. And open arachnoid gradually, slowly, but surely, and respect the normal. And you don't know at the very beginning which arteries, arteries going to the AVM, which arteries feeding the AVM. So you have to really, really, really define. And I, I, that's gonna, you are going to hear me today one hour or so repeating the same thing. Define, define your anatomy, define the pathological anatomy. And sharp dissection, blunt dissection, whichever dissection you feel comfortable. I, I don't have dogmas, I use whatever words. I'll start with the sharp dissection if I can do, with scissors or arachnoid knives or peeling, whatever works. So. I'm defining here the draining vein, okay? And I'm dissecting. And again, as I dissect, 
I gain more space towards the middle fossa floor. Now, once I define that, I am defining the sulcus and the gyri uh, affected by the AVM. So there will be no normal brain and there will be pathological brain. And you need to find that gliotic plane between the AVM and the surrounding normal brain. Again, going systematically, going around. So I haven't taken any archery or the vein or anything yet, okay? I keep dissecting, like doing the cadaveric dissection. Yes, you gain some knowledge when you look at the uh, imaging studies, uh, MRIs or, or angiography. But in my mind, until I get there, I won't know exactly where the feeders are. And, and by dissecting, I am gaining that knowledge. And, and see, this is normal vein, small. If it is in your way, you may want to take. But if it is not, just preserve. See, I'm going, and I don't know if this archery is a Ampassan archery, so I'm dissecting. See, I see a thrombose vessel here, and some of these AVMs can have spontaneous thrombosis of their draining draining vein. See, this is the this is the one, that's the vein, and this archery again going below the AVM. And see, I'm, I'm unlocking this sul sulcus and preserving this normal anatomy. See, that was a thrombose vein. So now I jump to the, another sulcus, okay? Keep going. Slow, but sure. And defining the anatomy of the pathological anatomy of the AVM. Again, I'm so this is a this is a typical appearance of we just missed it. See, this is a diving uh, feeding artery, and this is a typical appearance of the feeding arteries. They are comparing to the veins; they are smaller. Their wall looks relatively whiter. And now, this is the this is the AVM. I am defining that. And what about this? Where it is going? Is it going to the nidus or it is passing by? See, this is again typical appearance of the for the trainees and the young young colleagues. Typical appearance of the AVM arteries. Dissecting away from the night, uh, uh, draining vein. Draining vein is going to go deep towards the labe, temple base. Now I, I finish that aspect. I am going to the superior aspect of it. <coughs> so again, you are seeing this. These are not normal vessels, okay? You see they are going to the nidus and they are, these are AVM arteries. Oh, sorry. So don't be afraid of dissecting, okay? Dissection is the main thing. So I sometimes people do like a almost like a lobectomy, huge resection. No, no, you don't know what that part of the brain is, 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 has a function or not. Maybe it has a function for that particular patient. So just keep everything normal and minimize the cortical resection, okay? Again, now I know and I am taking and take the, and sometimes use these small AVM clips. They are good localizers good anatomical landmarks. So you can you can use them in the, if you are doing intro of angio, or maybe this part of the AVM, I left the nidus, so it, it, it helps you which, and you need to keep track 
which clip you put to where so you can you can see them so now i i start i start attacking the avm okay first i was dissecting only and as you see as i taking the feeders avm turns more blue so that means you are doing something good if avm is getting swollen more engorge that means you are not doing good you are interfering with the drainage you did something and you should stop at that point okay and inspect did you cause a hematoma and hematoma usually at the bottom of it when you are chasing the deep feeders did you cause intraventricular hemorrhage so you need to be aware of these and and that's why if you are if avm getting softer and bluish you are doing good thing okay so, and these see these are avm feeders these are avm arteries they are not supposed to be they are normally naturally loops avm vessels and inside your dissection plane all loops should stay inside okay and as you see avm is getting more and more blue see that's 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 the loops i was talking about these loops they you have to keep them inside the dissection plane or loops otherwise if you don't keep them it, they they can retract bleed and you won't be able to catch with the, your bipolar so it's conical spherical circumferential circumferential dissection see there's a classified portion of the avm and now i am finding a artery coursing at the bottom of the avm so is the question is this a avm artery or this is just ampasan artery giving the side feeders so you have to inspect only take the side feeders not to the main artery until you are 100% sure that's the feeding artery so i'm not still sure this is a artery i'm going to dissect see uh, and leave it alone and lastly i am taking the draining vein and i always put clip so and then you do your hemostasis okay and stop for 10 15 or 20 minutes and whatever the patient's normal pressure always maintain normal tensive okay not hypotensive not hypertensive during the dissection and at that time if patient's systolic blood pressure is normally 120 ask anesthesia to raise the blood pressure to 150 and after you finish your and you are satisfied with your hemostasis wait 15 20 minutes if you start having the bleeding two things either you didn't do good hemostasis or most importantly you left the residual nidus okay this is a technique i learned from roberto heroes i always stop dry everything and wait 15 20 minutes and ask anesthesia to raise blood pressure to 150 for example if the blood pressure is 120 normally okay so good satisfactory results uh, good mrsa score uh, he was discharged home. I like to keep them in the ICU a few days to make sure they're, they're not having the blood pressure uh, swings. And once I'm, I'm comfortable, I send them home. So surgical outcomes, multimodal, multimodality approach, proper surgical planning, intraoperative guidance with imaging tools, detailed no anatomical knowledge, and 
rigorous training and experience in microsurgery. Who did this? It starts with the Ashargil, Drake, Hero, Spester, Stein, and recently everybody else. And, and good results. If you are doing grade one, grade two, grade three, in my opinion, more mortality shouldn't be zero to 5%. It should be 0%, okay? Morbidity should be less than 5% in grade threes and grade one should be zero again. Permanent morbidity I'm talking about. You can have infection or something, sometimes we cannot control. And always go with the cure, goal of the curing the AVM, okay? Don't just do for partial things. And complications occur when you have a faulty preoperative judgment, okay? Grade five AVMs. Yes, some grade, very, very small number of grade fives, you can operate. Grade fours, yes, I've done grade fours too, but not all of them. Don't abuse embolization, preoperative embolization. And if necessary, use it. In only certain conditions, I use embolization. And have a cor correct understanding of the AVM. Don't underestimate the patient's comorbidities and have a perfect surgical planning and have a perfect surgical timing, okay? Sometimes may not be possible, but try your best. Intraoperative, what causes more problems? Two wide margins of resection, causing parenchymal hemorrhage, unrecognized intraparenchymal or intraventricular hemorrhages, early occlusion of draining veins, Retracting damage. Don't retract the brain, retract the AVM. Retract the tentorium, retract the fox. okay? So if you left a residual AVM, you're gonna have a problem. In very high flow AVMs, this is described by Dr. Spester, perfusion breakthrough, watch for it. Seizures, retrograde venous thrombosis, retrograde arterial thrombosis, questionable. Some of these feeding arteries, eventually they get stagnant flow and you don't know how to progress, how they are going to progress. So just watch for them. Vasospasm and shock brain, these are all questionable. So another case to show, another uh, straightforward case to show you the surgical techniques, okay? This is a incidentally found, uh, and we didn't know he, he had a recent personality changes. This is truly incidental, or this is due to the still phenomenon, and we work him up as kind of high flow AVM, and, and we decide to go ahead with the resection, okay? So position, surgery starts with the position, right? So for anterior interhemispheric approach and, and middle interhemispheric approach, you can use neutral position, which is good for better anatomical orientation, definitely. But sometimes it can be limiting the non-dominant hand or dominant hand, depends on the side and it depends on the uh, handness of the surgeon. You can do ipsilateral side down, contralateral side down, and I'll prefer very anterior ones if I need to go to the anterior cranial fossa, neutral position. Little more posterior or middle ones, I like to do ipsilateral side down, and in certain cases, contralateral side down, so I cut, you can cut the fox and look, have a direct look at the AVM. For posterior ones, spine ipsilateral down or semi-sitting is the best to me, but you can use anything you, are, you feel comfortable. Ipsilateral side down or contralateral side down helps the brain fall away from the fox with the gravity. So another case, so this is a neutral position in telemispheric dissection, always cross to, if you, I always cross to midline, if I am going to interhemispheric, okay? If I am going transtentorial, I'm gonna cross transfer sinus. After initial inspection and dissection, go interhemispheric dissection. So where are the feeders in this location? Very clear. I, you don't need to look at the angiogram to know the feeders. In this location, feeders from, will be from the anterior cerebral artery. So you need to find, find them, right? So go for, Go for proximal control, basically.
So this, for some reason, in AVMs, arachnoid will be more thickened and thicker. So you have to carefully dissect. Uh, if, if you have any doubts, you know, you are not cutting arachnoid or anything, just don't do anything. Just leave, leave that area, come back. See, I'm finding the pericallosal arteries. So it's quite atherosclerotic pericallosal artery. And freeing, freeing the AVM from the normal, okay? So go now, more distal. Are you gonna follow that? So you, I'm seeing the AVM nidus protecting with the cotton pedis while I'm dissecting. This is Falx. This is contralateral hemisphere, normal veins. So free the normal from the pathologic. And be patient, okay? In the AVM, in any surgery, you have to be patient. Don't rush it. Okay, now we are free more. It takes time, but if you go to lab, do this in the lab, peeling and cleaning the P arachnoid of the cadaveric brain, you develop this tactile sense, okay? That's what I did when I was resident or fellow or doing nothing. Even now, sometimes I go to lab and clean the brain, okay? It, it keeps your skills up and these skills, for AVM or you are doing insular glioma surgery or brainstem surgery or aneurysm surgery or skull base meningioma, similar skills, okay? Similar skill sets, so microsurgery. You don't have to do 5,000 AVM to be a good, okay? If you are a good microsurgeon, you are doing reasonably good things, you can do it. Understanding the AVM pathophysiology and the pathological anatomy, that comes with the experience. And then you need masters, you need mentors to watch and learn how they, how they do, okay? And I, I thank my mentor, Professor Hiros, uh, extensive experience with the AVM. See, this is, a, these are the, this is on Passan artery, transit artery, okay? So giving side feeders, and I'm coagulating in, see, not constant coagulation, just coagulating and cutting. So, so you don't take it right away. The same, same principle when you are doing insular glioma surgery. You take only the side feeders coming from the insular M2s. Okay, see that's another side feeder. This is large varix. So this, side, this a, a, transit artery is coursing over this gigantic varics, okay? Taking and cutting. Once you sure you're coagulate. And Dr. Hiros calls this, if you do just one time, Mickey Mouse bipolaring, don't do that. So the constant, okay? Gradual shrinkage of the of the vessel you are coagulating with the bipolar. Sharp dissection if necessary, okay. Protect the normal brain, protect the nidus, and especially in the high magnification for young colleagues, it's good to change your magnification once in a while, go to the lower magnification, see your surroundings, okay. In the high magnification, sometimes we lose orientation and you start doing it and you are, when you're passing the instruments in and out, you can injure the normal, normal structures, okay? So orient yourself and change your magnification and position constantly. Not only one position, always change your microscope position. And I always use mouthpiece. Uh, without mouthpiece, I cannot operate. They call it Turkish pacifier in our operating room. If I don't have a mouthpiece, I am, I am very, very irritable like a little babies, right? So this is another thing. I'm, I'm applying the Yashargis peeling technique, okay? Because 
I don't know why, but sometimes I feel like cutting sharply may, I may cause injury. And then I do peeling and sometimes I do spreading and this comes with the time. Uh, I cannot explain you when I feel I need to cut, when I feel I need to do peeling or spreading. So now I'm skeletonizing the AVM one by one, patiently, okay? And it's, you guys are lucky now, you can watch these from 10,000 miles or kilometer away. Uh, in my time, we were not able to ha watch these surgeries uh, and the masters in, uh, uh, and travel a lot. So uh, now you can travel, you can watch these surgeries online. See, I'm defining. And then it's see, it start turning blue and it's less torches, okay? So that means I am doing okay. I am doing good. I, I, now I'm sure that vessel is going with the irrigating bipolar. I coagulate and cut, okay? I don't want to bore you guys with this, but if you watch these multiple times, 100 times, then you learn. The fellows who come and visit me from all over the world, they watch these in, the, in our lab. We have a, a video library and uh, over and over and over again. By watching, they learn a lot and they go back to their home countries uh, and they, they perform these surgeries. And I always hear good things. Okay, I, I'm glad I watched this video because I, I encountered this kind of problem uh, and similar to the case you did. And I see some of my former fellows online right now. I salute them uh, from all over the world. See, I'm keeping the loops inside, okay? Inside your dissection plane. So these are AVM loops. And uh, people name these techniques like a UHA, UHA causes dirty coagulation. So you coagulate and cut with the bipolar and keep moving, okay? Uh, see, the, this is a thrombose part of the uh, AVM vessel. So AVM is dying. I feel it. See, its, it's color is changing. See, again, there's a loop there. I'm keeping loop inside, okay? And away from the normal brain towards the AVM. Again, see, there are loops there. And if they retract, you may not be able to find them, okay? So coagulate and if when you are 100% sure, then cut. If not, if you are not 100% sure, you put a little mini AVM clips so they don't retract towards the brain parenchymal, brain ventricle. These are the causes of uh, uh, profuse bleeding, especially at the end of the AVM resection. They are always at the bottom in the in the white matter. So, uh, so my assistant is helping me retracting the AVM. Okay, and gentle. That's why assistance is very important and you, your assistant should know when to irrigate, when not to irrigate, when to retract, how to retract, and it has, has to have a tactile senses. You cannot do this surgery with the second year resident. You can in some, but you know, when you run into trouble, you won't have help. So I'm gonna speed up. So this artery at the bottom of it. So I preserve that Ampasan artery at the bottom by taking that. Now I'm skeletonizing the draining vein and see where the draining vein is going. I wanna take the vein closest point to the AVM. You don't wanna take, and then you don't wanna interfere with the normal drainage. Okay, still I'm not sure and I'm dissecting, making sure. Being curious in the AVM surgery is, in many things is very good. So you always 
always make sure don't assume in any surgery Okay, lastly, we take the draining vein, put a permanent clip, strong clip. See, I took that, but there is a there is an area I I was suspicious. See, and I wasn't happy with that area, so I went back inspect, and I thought these are the AVM vessels. Sometimes you can have a dysplastic arteries surrounding the uh, surrounding the uh, uh, avm nidus but this is this wasn't one of them and i decided to reject that small area okay and then we did that and i i see I didn't use any embolization. Embolization in these straightforward AVMs make the surgery more difficult. It's not, it doesn't make easier, okay? And plus I'm taking the feeders by direct inspection, okay? So only use embolization when it is necessary, absolutely necessary, like perinidal aneurysms, or you, you think the taking the perforator at the very deep is going to help you. But in, in general, I'm telling you, uh, I changed more and more uh, and moved towards the no embolization over years uh, because I think it's embolization doesn't help a lot and, and increases the difficulty of the surgery. Again, we hemostase and then wait for 15, 20 minutes, increase the blood pressure. You see the veins are turning the blue, that's a good sign. That means you did fine and there's no residual. You can do ICG green, intraangiogram. Okay, you see the postoperative angiogram, good resection. He did very well. He was discharged home. And this is a very recent case, 20 year old man with the uh, 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 new onset seizures is quite, quite anterior and involves the left singlet gyrus all the frontal pole, frontal orbital region, and with the very, very large draining veins, superficial veins. In this midline, midline, so according to Spester Martin grading, deep drainage is not good, right? But in this midline vein, midline AVMs, having the superficial drainage actually causes more difficulty for surgeon. I don't want to have a superficial drainage because it's on my way. I want to have a deep drainage. Uh, that's me, but uh, that's what I think. So this is a huge AVM. Again, this is a, a anterior portion of the limbic lobe. So we'll go fast. And the most difficulty here is the patient had a strange, huge calcification of the fox and it made it made surgery at the beginning very difficult because I had to dissect this hours to free the AVM and the veins. See, so there's vessels calcified and fused with the calcified fox. But, you know, you spend time and you, you get it out and dissect it. Traction and contra-traction, like doing the tumor surgery sometimes, one hand tracks, other hand contracts. We're gonna find the main feeder, right? Main feeder will be ipsilateral pericallosal and the callosal marginal. So you have to find them and identify the, identify the feeders coming from them, okay? So I, this is the, this is the dissection. Now I'm going, performing the sulcal dissection around the AVM and nidus. Once I, 
I'm satisfied with my sulcal dissection and taking the feeders, AVM is becoming soft. Then I dive into the, that gliotic plane. So, we ret so I'm retracting the CAVM. AVM is turning blue. Okay, no embolization. If this was embolized, it will be very hard. That onyx mass makes manipulations are more difficult. And deeper part of the AVM, those the loops I was talking about earlier. So he has been seizure free uh, and he did very well. MRSA score zero. Another one, 26 year old uh, lymphoma survivor. And during the lymphoma uh, surveillance, they found this AVM, they followed and, and she started getting the headaches. She was, she was very concerned and we did the same thing, same principle, okay onto a single it AVM, remove it. In this case, is early case, see, I embolize. Why? Why did I embolize? Because I wasn't sure, is it helping or not? Now I'm, I, I'm in similar case you saw, I didn't embolize. It made surgery more difficult and longer. And you see the old Ampassan artery, so it's small, small. You see the clips around the pericolosal artery. So skeletonized. Uh, this is a 42 year old, now more posterior cingulate. So look at the, he had at least four bleeding episodes and due to the location, it's called, this AVM called inoperable by few centers, few reputable centers. And they did the functional MRI and the functional MRI, uh, uh, Motor cortex, especially the foot area, is very close to the AVM, and your rod is through that. But you can come even you come this way, you still have to manipulate the uh, uh, motor cortex, especially the foot and leg area. So um, to me, this is a, not a motor cortex AVM, but is uh, still it was very difficult to convince the patient. Uh, but he had, he had enough with the bleed. So he, every time he had bleed, he had to be hospitalized, ventriculostomies, all that stuff. And, and in this case, again, this is one of the old case. I said, maybe I should embolize the, the, not the anterior superficial feeders, but the posterior feeders from the posterior cerebral artery. Uh, because they will, they will be deeper and, and that's what we did, okay? Just embolize enough, like my mentor, Dr. Hiros told me. But turned out to be, it wasn't even necessary. Why, why did I subject the patient to another procedure? Embolization is not a risk-free procedure. Nothing we do is risk-free. Surgery, radiation, or embolization, okay? So you don't wanna add two procedures. So why while I was concerned, okay, oh, maybe this is the deep part, I will have difficulty reaching there and I will be tired after several hours and this is the last portion of the dissection, I embolized, but didn't cause any complication, but it could have. And, and in this case, it was quite large and patient had a recent hemorrhage. Uh, I worry about swollen brain. I put the ipsilateral side down with the gravity brain. I use lumbar drain in this case, not every case I use. And you'll see, uh, this is an old case. And you'll see embolization. Sometimes you think you, are, you embolize and you cut these embolized vessels, they bleed. Uh, I don't know if they included in this uh, edition of the video, but when I cut the onyx, onyx vessel, it still bleeds. So when, when they say oh, completely embolized, 
I don't believe it. Yeah, anyway, we this took like a 12 hours long surgery. You see the onyx material here and make harder and difficult to dissect. And you cannot really soften the AVM because it's embolized, but luckily this was the bottom part of the AVM and eventually we got it and we removed it completely. Uh, and he, he woke up with the uh, leg weakness, three over five, improved over two to three days and remained completely normal uh, and has been like AVM free for more than 10 years now. So in this case, ipsilateral side down, lumbar drain, it wasn't necessary. This is a singlet AVM and, and it stay, when you with your dissection, stay close to the nidus away from the motor cortex. That was the key. And this is, shows a complete resection and, and good MRI results. This is another one. In, in this case is important to emphasize the, again, transit arteries and passant arteries. You'll, you'll have many of these in this location, perisylvian going, going to the insula. And these, these feeders will be mainly MCA and some from the PCA. And you can have also, the depends on the involvement of the medial basal region, you can have from the choroidals too, but in this case, there was no. So you have to, you have to spend time and find these arteries. I, I wish I could have shown the video of this. They lost this video. And uh, so I spent hours of dissecting this. I mean, like a, having like a 10 centimeter insular glioma. And this is a nice depiction of the anatomy and the angiogram uh, by Dr. Isan Doan. So uh, it shows you and eventually see small, 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 small clips and all the M MCAs, M2s, insular branches are all preserved. And this is a, a almost a Wernicke area, uh, incidentally found AVM. Uh, we did the functional MRI. Functional MRI in AVMs, questionable. Uh, sometimes I do, if, especially if we are not sure about the true dominance. And we use special Dyna CT to show the anatomy better. And this is the AVM. See again, doing nothing, just, just dissecting, 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 dissecting. And then my resins get tired when I'm dissecting these vessels, but the, actually it seems like it's prolonging the surgery, but in reality, it's making faster at the at the end so this is the avm and there are few on passant arteries here you need to find them and take only the feeding arteries not the main arteries respect to the normal normal the small So these bipolars are helpful, irrigating bipolars or bipolar, normal bipolar with the, your assistant irrigating. Uh, sometimes I do ICG green. It's not crucial to have ICG green to do AVMs, but if I cannot tell something, I always do. Whatever you have, use it. It doesn't change. It doesn't make you a good surgeon, but it helps you, okay? See, AVM is turning blue, softer, then you dive and do the parenchymal dissection. So keeping these loops, loops inside, okay? Inside, and this is normal sulcus. See, I took all these side feeders. This is the draining varix. Retract the, retract the AVM, not the brain. It comes, turns around, and goes to the normal brain. 
if you take that, you are taking the normal supply. Constantly inspect, constantly. Are, am I missing anything? Dissect, make sure, and then leave that part, move to the another part. Here I'll do hemostasis and wait for 10, 15 minutes or 20 minutes. I did ICG green. And looks good. Vein is thrombose. You are doing fine. Again, when he woke up, he was uh, receptive aphasic uh, uh, moderately and improved over several days and, and completely normal now. And he's cured. Uh, this is a Hippocampal AVM, 46-year-old presented with the new seizures. And uh, these are tough cases, uh, this medial basal region, uh, hippocampal uh, AVMs, question mark incision. And it's, you, it's hard to find the, uh, uh, the choroidal feeders in this case and then PCA feeders. They are at the, underneath the uh, uh, AVM nidus. So first you go to the normal, you find the anatomy. I made a, I made a, a cortic, I went subtemporal, pretemporal, and then I, I made the incision between fusiform gyrus and the parapocampal gyrus and got into the ventricle. And then once you got into the ventricle, you know the normal anatomy. You have to open the choroidal fissure, which is here. And this is entire uh, anterior one third of the hippocampus is AVM. Uh, so I'll, if I'm gonna Doppler the hippocampus, it will show that this is a, it's completely nidal. See, so that's hippocampus. That's AVM within the hippocampus, taking the small feeders, temporary clip first. I'm not sure. I am sure now I'm taking the temporary clip, putting the permanent. And open, further opening the choroidal fissure, mobilizing the choroidal artery and the feeder from the choroidal artery. Then eventually we'll find the PCA feeders and skeletonize the PCA underneath the AVM. See that, that could retract, that's okay. If it is, you suspect it's retracting, just put the cl uh, micro clip for that, okay? So further dissecting away from the choroidal fissure. Preserve your planes, take your time. These are 3D videos originally. They look very red compared to the 2D recorded videos. So I apologize for that, uh, but I couldn't find a solution how to overcome this. So they look, more red than the uh, actual. So I'm not this bloody surgeon, this much bloody. This is choroid plexus dissecting, large draining vein. Inspecting again. So I had to use the retractor, which I don't like using it normally, but this is a deep area and well padded the cortex. Again, don't be dogmatic. Instead of damaging with constant retraction with your bipolar, just put the retraction, just hold, hold the brain. Like uh, Taka Fukushima tells you, 
Just, I'm holding the brain. I'm holding the brain. That's what he says. Okay, go, go. And last part of the surgery, disconnecting the draining vein. If you have a more than one draining vein and after dissecting enough, you can take one of them in some circumstances, but not at the beginning, okay? So this is the final. She did very well actually, uh, and she's been tumor uh, seizure free with very good resection and very perfect functional outcome. This is the unf unfortunate case because they have waited so long for this patient, 72 year old, and uh, it started developing this peri AVM, edema, and mental decline. She, he already lost peripheral vision and waited for several years. And finally, he became almost like a demented. And the families sought for uh, uh, another opinion. And they came to me, I said, yeah, we can reject this. And her, his visual field, I don't know, if it's gonna same or worse or uh, uh, be better. I, I assume it's not gonna be better, but at least we can improve his mental, mental decline. And, this is a case, there's a direct AV fistula within the nidus. So again, this is a faulty decision. I said maybe we occlude the nidus, I mean the fistula, so it helps me to, to perform the surgery. We did that and, and the, our intervention is super, super experienced. And she said there's something wrong, let's check this is gonna be thrombosing or not. And believe it or not, it start thrombosing. So, and then we push the surgery date right after the embolization. Uh, so, and you see the, that giant varix start thrombosing and he, if he didn't act, he was gonna have more problems. So we, and the problem here, also the AVM main feeder, PCA feeder will be under, and you'll be dealing with the partially thrombosed gigantic varix. And you can watch this in neurosurgical focus actually. So I'm gonna speed up. Uh, so this is all trom thrombosed varix, giant varix, and nidus is under it. So I'm retracting the nidus and trying to find these feeders under the, this gigantic varix. And feeders from the uh, PCA, this is an occipital approach. You have to have an interhemispheric, and then also you have to expose the tentorium so very wide exposure, okay? Don't be minimalistic, see it's bleeding and a part of the AVMs calcified and it makes difficult to manipulate. So if it is bleeding, just tamponate, okay? Tamponate on the AVM side, not, not on the brain side. And actually see this, there, we had multiple bleeds and every time I put the surgery central gel foam and cotton and then the retractor on top of it. So I'm going to find that. See, it's, it is, it's gonna become very obvious soon. There are these feeders coming from the, that large PCA. So there's a longer version of version of this video you can watch. It's published. All the feeders one by one. At your your right hand, dominant hand, work working under this uh, varix and the retraction uh, gets tired over time. Uh, so if you feel that like you're getting tired, just rest. A few minutes you know, relax and stretch and then come back. Don't take a risk.
see it start turning blue is becoming softer and then it's actually there's more than one and see it's very calcified it's not even coagulating okay so i put i i'm biting the nidus with the with the clip in one point and then i put gel foam and cotton and retracting with the retractor to stop the bleed tamponate the bleed and that huge huge feeder see that's uh, sorry this is actually varix that uh, fistula fistulous point you saw the onyx there that's done now we are coming to the draining vein So now I'm I'm using like old old microscopic techniques and remove the nidus. Nidus is not very big, varix is giant. So I have to remove the varix that's causing the uh, 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 swelling. So I remove most of it. Don't push your luck too much. Okay. So this is right after surgery. His Vision remain unchanged, uh, but mentally he got much better. So he was he didn't have a dementia. He was uh, this was a direct uh, effect from the AVM. So I'm gonna skip this case. Same principles. And what about the timing of surgery? How should we time in case of emergencies? I think other day I saw a note from IP. Uh, he did a, a young patient child with emergency AVM. And this is one of the example. This is a 55 year old, I'm gonna cut it short, sorry, but this is 55 year old man with known AVM and seizure disorder from the AVM. And they follow this uh, because it's dominant lobe, okay, medial basal region. And six years later or five years later, he presented in coma, GCS3. And when he was transferred, he had only pupillary function, okay? So we put the ventric, we put the two ventrics. After a while, uh, uh, this is his previous CT angiograms actually. And some of the uh, functions come back, he start localizing. No, uh, no, he wasn't even localizing. He start moving some. And, and then we took him to the angio quickly. And from angio, we took him to the emergency surgery. So I did a large crani craniotomy. So if you have a swollen brain, like, you know, uh, I see Ipes point in the cisternostomy, right? Cisternotomy, perfect points. My point, in addition to cisternostomy, go to the ventricle, do ventriculostomy, okay? How ventricles open ventricles to me with surgery, okay? I, brain is so swollen, he's dying, right? I have to do something. First, stabilize the situation. I went to the superior frontal gyrus. I'm, I'm suctioning blood from the left ventricle, frontal horn, okay? And going, okay, I'm in the ventricle, getting the last pieces of, I decompress, okay? as much as you can until you see the all the way and then under direct vision i am putting my my ventriculostomy and now situation is better brain relax and decision is should we do anything should we stop here or should we carry on that is the hard decision in these cases emergency cases so i was there and I wasn't happy with the amount of the clot I aspirated from the frontal horn. So I said, I'm gonna remove the AVM, I'm gonna decompress the temporal horn too. And this is what we did. 
This is a video, old video again, nicely edited by uh, one, one of my former fellows, Dr. Tefik from Diyarbakir, Turkey. So uh, this is the initial ICG green. So I'm gonna do the same thing like I show you guys, okay? Dissect, dissect, dissect. Eventually, doesn't matter is emergency or not. Do the same principles, okay? Little faster maybe, but that's all. And go around it, go around it. And get into the ventricle. There's a ble bleeding point. After I resect the main one, I, I, I thought there's a residual and this is the residual part, bleeding. I will stop that and I will go to the temple horn Yeah, I'm in the temple horn, suction all that blood, decompress the temple horn, and put another ventriculostomy into the temple horn because sometimes they can have a, these CSF issues in this extensive bleeds, and one ventricle doesn't work, other and the temple horn blows. So you have to you have to be cognizant of that. Okay, so uh, post-op angio we did. Intraop angio right away, complete resection of the AVM, immediate CT scan, and day three, day four, he start improving, start localizing. In approximately three weeks, everything is looks good. In two months, MRSA score two. In one year, MRSA score one. He's cured. He's not. He's not having any seizures. So emergency surgery. It sometimes is good for AVMs, okay? And this is another case, came to us from other center emergently, large hematoma, and he, she was comatose, GCS6, became GCS3 en route, uh, and we did the quick angio and took her to the surgery, and they did the same thing. Evacuate the hematoma, and then, then remove the AVM, same. It's small nidus, I don't wanna come back. I'm there, I'm evacuating the hematoma. I can remove this, doesn't matter. And she's perfect, perfect. MRSA score zero at one year. It takes time to improve though, okay? So finally, yes, grade fives, we don't like operating and in most grade fives, if you don't have an aim of cure, if you don't, if you think you can cure it, you can cure the AVM, and patient is severely symptomatic, then have a plan: multi-modality treatment, stage radiation, then resection, embolization, radiation, and then resection. But don't do partial treatment for any AVM, especially in grade fives and the grade fours. If you have a pedicle aneurysm that bled, embolize that, or take care of it but the don't touch the nidus if nidus didn't bleed. And, and in certain grade fives and the fours, you can still do surgery. Preoperative embolization, please use that only to reduce the risk of overall treatment plan. Don't, don't use it just for your convenience, okay? And it should be guided by the, your surgical goals, surgical considerations. It has, it should serve a purpose. If you think it's, AVM is very close, right adjacent to the eloquent area, embolize that area, turn that dissection to the meningioma dissection. Don't embolize just to embolize. And you should have a, a your main treatment of the AVM should be cured. Partial treatment is not good for AVMs. It changed the natural history in a worse way. I'm not going to talk about radio surgery, but radio surgery has so certain role in AVM treatment, especially small and deep, eloquent regions. So we know the natural history, and we know natural history is not good in especially young patients, symptomatic patients, and every decision should be made based on the, that individual patient. You should not have algorithms for AVMs. Oh, I treat this AVM, this great, oh, this feeder, that. No, every AVM is different and present those 
best option to the patient, not, not literature, okay? All oh, this literature, radio surgery, 90% and surgery. Your, your experience and how that patient, particular patient should be treated in your opinion. And always assess your, your results, okay? If you are doing something wrong, you need to be aware. I don't have any mortality in any AVM. I have one morbidity that is a uh, bone flap infection in uh, 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 asymptomatic incidentally found aneurysm, but it didn't cause long-term morbidity. So, but because I select these patients, I select the ones that I can help. I don't just jump and do surgeries or treatments from every, every AVM cases. So you have to know the anatomy. I, you know, every talk we emphasize this anatomy, spend time in the lab, go to the lab. You develop these tactile senses doing the glioma surgery, doing GBM. If you, if you have a case, simple case, open the dura under the microscope, close the dura under the microscope, okay? Go do something in the lab, microscopic level in a gradual. Don't jump from uh, four zero to the 10 zero, okay? Go four zero five zero six zero seven zero eight zero nine zero ten zero eleven zero twelve zero. This is just example. And be versatile in performing and going seeing these patients. Choose choose a shokinin. Shokinin a Japanese word. You have a mentors in your home institution, but you can develop mentors, have mentors in other institutions. For example, I am now due to this pandemic, I, I'm becoming your mentor. And I, I'm also following other people easily. So I train multiple institutions, but I have mentors in other institutions. I didn't know, I didn't have any contact with them before. Okay, I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, I do, I, I understand. Read, listen, watch, dissect. Do whatever you can. You, you ask, you know, oh, how can I, I don't have this, but you can develop, you know, you can suture it. You find the suture, you can suture a paper under pathology microscope, okay? Try your best and watch these surgeries, okay? Don't give up. Don't be pessimistic about the microsurgery. Microsurgery is resurging, okay? Microsurgery will be alive and will continue to do microsurgery. I'll, I'll thank my fellows who helped me, especially Dr. Uh, uh, Sayamelli, Sima, and please come and visit us. Again, I take uh, too, too much uh, your time. Uh, I apologize and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, great, Dr. Mustafa, as usual. We had a full house. We had to turn people away. Uh, anyways, Aipa, are you there? Do you want to moderate? Yeah, I am. Go ahead, Aipa. Can you see me, John? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, let me get uh, Mustafa off the screen there. Hold on. Okay. There you go. Okay. There you go. Mustafa. Hi, hey. Hi my friend. Pretty really good. Excellent lecture as usual again. Excellent lecture. Thank you very so, much. Yeah, so, you know, it. Uh, day before yesterday, we had a ruptured AVM, you know, yeah. and I and I went in thinking about uh, evacuation of an ICH. I mean, I was tired and uh, it was uh, pre it was evening time. It was this talk time. Jimmy Liu was doing the talk and I, and I, somebody told me it's an ICH. Uh, so I went in, we did a flap. Fortunately, I saw the AVM and I, I saw the scans and I thought maybe it could be an AVM, this 36 year old guy. And it was crazy, you know, I mean, it's going in, took out the ICH and was, you know, bleeding helter skelter. So it is crazy. So, I mean, the last case that you showed, we went into, we went and did cystinostomy and it uh, really made it lax. And then of course, then we could shift to the microscope. But before that, it was crazy. It was a, uh, 65 ml of bleed, so it was quite a large bleed and pretty large AVM. We didn't have NGOs or anything. So went ahead and uh, excised it. Now we'll have to do an NGO. The guy is localizing right now. So when your AVM talks came, I was interested. So, well, uh, for the young guys, 
one thing I would agree with you is that uh, embolization makes things difficult. I, well, we don't have embolization, so we don't have a choice to go with embolization. We don't have coiling in, in this place. So most of the patients, if you give them a choice to coil or embolize, they never take it here because it's too costly for us. So um, an embolization, whenever I have operated a couple of embolized AVMs, I realized that the best thing about an AVM is that, that you can move the AVM around. Once you dissect, you can move the AVM around. And once you embolize, you lose that capability of moving that AVM around. So it becomes firm and stiff and it becomes difficult. So uh, I completely agree with your principle that, uh, you know, embolizing an AVM is always difficult. It's not good. Uh, the second thing for the young guys, when we go through these AVMs, most of, most of the guys that I've seen, if I ask them, okay, go ahead and do this, they say, no, we cannot. Um, that's one thing, being pessimistic, you know, they, I mean, all this science about uh, outcomes and all this science about uh, other things, better results and all that, is after you become an expert. And in your country, if you don't do things and if you don't have your initial complications, you're never going to start anything. So I'm sure Mustafa would tell you that we all have our share of complications. I've had my share of complications for sure. I've had my share of disasters with AVM. So, and unless you, I mean, maybe it's always not you're not very lucky to have a guy who's doing AVM before you in your center or even in your country. I see a lot of guys, uh, I have a lot of fellows from Africa and uh, these guys are not going back and they say, no, no, this surgery cannot be done. So I always tell them, no, it's not true. So the pessimistic attitude about microsurgery has to go, number one. Number two is patience. What I see in Mustafa's videos is that he he sits down and dissects the same way I do for my aneurysms or AVMs or anything. People think, what am I doing? Why am I spending uh, too much time? So dissection and patience. And if you feel, there are two things. One is impatience and one is tiredness. Both these things, I get out. Get out of the field, breathe a little bit, sometimes even scrub out. Walk around a bit, then come back. It's always better to do that rather than be bit, I mean, being an, a bit impatient and then making a move which will, which will end up, you know, you spending, end, ending up two hours more in the OR. So it's always better if you, have a, if you have a bit of impatience or a bit of tiredness, just move back, sit in your chair, look at the angiogram or listen to a song. Or, I mean, I often do my, the, my theater, Everybody, you know, sometimes get puzzled by my behavior. Sometimes I just uh, scrub out and just walk out. I'm not doing anything. I'm not pissed off with anything, but I just walk out and I, I take my time and then I come back and it's a completely different scenario. You see, you need to get a break and then you can do this. So these are all things that the young uh, guys need to get. Mm -hmm. And uh, excellent talk as usual. Congratulations, Mustafa. Thank we look you, forward to your thank talks. you, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity, and I uh, wholeheartedly, hundred percent agree everything you said. And um, I do the same. If something go is going wrong, I just stop. And the, I learned from my uh, days I used to play basketball, and you know I was doing. I think I was doing very well, but the coach takes me and it sits me out. And I, I was so angry with my coach, you know, why are you sitting me out? I, he said, no, no, you are not seeing it. You are not knowing how bad you are doing. That's why I'm sitting you out. So, and now what I do, I ask my assistant residents or even the nurses, ask your nurses in the operating room. Hey, am I doing something wrong? Raise your voice. They will tell you, they'll see the picture sometimes. You just ask opinion and then just stop it. Don't insist. And uh, I 100% agree with you. Okay, we we'll, we we'll, we are micros, we are surgeons. We'll have complications. Complications shouldn't scare you. 
I mean, if if you say I don't have any complication, yeah, I mean, we don't have complications. I mean, and my worst complications are the simplest cases, subdurals and the shunts. I cause, not the resins. Boom. Okay, so we are surgeons. We are neurosurgeons. Okay, we are here. We are green beret of this field. I'm sorry if is there if there's anybody else other than neurosurgeons <laughs> here, but so uh, we are green beret. I mean, no question. We work harder. We are smarter. I mean, not smarter, but uh, maybe more stupid to become neurosurgeon. But we we have this is a lifestyle. Okay. So microsurgery continues and watch your leaders. And I 100% I agree with you, I, and I wholeheartedly uh, thank you for doing this platform. You guys are great. John, this is a lot of effort. Uh, thank you very much. Hira, thank you very much. All other organizers, you guys are wonderful. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay, very good. Okay, Mustafa, thank you very much uh, for all your time you're putting in. Great education. And thank all the panelists and thank you, White. So we'll see you tomorrow okay. at the usual time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. See thank you, Mustafa. You. See you, John. See you, bye my bye. friend. Bye-bye. Yeah.